My name's John Burton. Today I'm going to tell my story about how I grew up in the criminal world and how I've come past that now and lead a straight life. I was born up on Vauxhall Road in Vauxhall Gardens. I moved from there at the age of seven to Walton in between Everton and Liverpool's grounds on Fountains Close. And from there um, I grew into a criminal and I always knew in life that that was the way I was going to go. It started at probably in 1987, 88. Um, I went to Quadrant Park and I've always heard about this Quadrant Park that, you know, it was the new rave scene, rave had just come out and everyone was on LSD and ecstasy and stuff and because we'd never sort of touched that, we didn't really know what it was about. Um, I went to Quadrant Park and the first time I went there, it sort of opened my eyes and changed, that's where the big change in my life come because when I went in there, I'd just seen everyone with glow sticks, whistles, everyone sweating, having a good time. And from there then, you know, I took my first ecstasy in there. And I must admit, I probably had the best night of my life growing up there. And then the week after I wanted to go, I didn't have the money to go. So I went and got um, five, I think it was about 150 tablets the first time, 150 years. Sold them in the club, had a weekend out, paid for me and all my mates to have a weekend out. And I still had a couple of grand in my pocket. You know, every drug dealer is in it for one reason, to capitalise and make, make as much money as you can. And I think the week after we got 500 pills and then the week after that we got more and I think it was just grown from there and we just controlled different parts of the uh, city where we were selling, probably had about 15 lads selling different pills and having a meet on the Monday, collecting it all in and then just rolling again the week after. See, the thing is, it's, it's them 10 out of the 15 lads probably weren't with us, they were just people who were selling for us. There was probably a handful of us who were just collecting the money every week off them. And we seen the amount of money that was coming in off it. We just basically kept getting more and growing and growing until we started buying our own. Do you know what? We didn't really have territories. We just had clubs, people going in and out of clubs. And obviously we were, we were working with the doorman on there as well. So for us, it weren't about having a territory. It was just about getting into the clubs and, and obviously having good nights out with ecstasy. And I think it was all going well up until about, I think it was about 1994, 95. And I think, I think a young girl from Essex died, a girl called Leah Betts. And obviously that's when the police just clamped right down on ecstasy. And obviously the sentences then were getting a little a bit higher. And don't forget, cocaine started coming into the country in the late 80s. In them days though, you had, you had a couple of police that would probably tip you off who you knew. Um, obviously technology again weren't like it is today. So you know, you, you get a little, you get a little sort of tip off that people were looking at you and you'd had a piss off abroad or you'd just stay at home and stop everything for a few months and just live, try and live a normal life. But it's not that easy. You're addicted to it. I don't know why, but everyone used to come up to me and ask me for ecstasy in a club. I must have just looked like a drug dealer, you know, so me only mate to be standing there and they'd just come straight to me. Have you got any pills? I'll say, do I look like a drug dealer? They go, yeah. <laughs> so it was just, it was just one of them. So with the cigarettes, I think um, someone just made a mistake and I think one number got us all arrested in the end. Um, I had 26 wagons with um, between 28 and 32,000 sleeves in. So they're the 200 packets. I had about 28 to 32,000 in each wagon but I also had four containers in Felix Stowe Dock with 90,000 in each of them. So I think when we got arrested, um, it was the customs and excise. Obviously the police don't get involved in anything to do with VAT or evasion of tax. So it was customs and excise who got me first. And they had me, I think, with 1.2 million sleeves of cigarettes. So I got a uh, four years uh, prison sentence. And then because I'd spent a lot of money on property and lap dancing clubs, stuff like that, they just basically seized everything. I was angry. I was angry and uh, when I come out of prison in 2005, I was angry that they took everything off me and I just wanted to get out there and say, do you know what, I'm cracking on again and getting my money back. And that's what I did. Weed, cocaine, uh, amphetamines, uh, ecstasy, anything that I could sort of get in bulk and sell in bulk, that, that's what I was doing. And I was just, for a good few years, I was in and out of Spain and stuff like that. And, getting involved in smuggling and importations and obviously meeting different people over there and trying to get all my money back. I, I, I see it as sad now. Then I didn't, I didn't care because they owed me money or they owed us money and you know, we'd go as a team and go and get it. But it's when you're in that life, you're, you're just focused on one thing. When you come out of the life and you actually sit back and 
see the stuff that you, d you shouldn't have got involved in, then you see it as a different light. But when you're in the game, it, it's totally different than you know being out the game. I got out in 2005. Um, I got arrested at the start of 2011. Um, I got arrested because I was getting bigger and bigger in, in, in the world of drugs. And when you start getting bigger like that and you start giving bigger bits out to people, then people talk. And I found out that the police had put a blocker on me and wanted me out of the Northwest because I'd had too much influence on cons, prison officers and the drug culture in the north of England. Um, at that time, I was still a big lad. I was obviously mouthy skinheads walking around jail training all the time and I was a little bit boisterous and then from there they, uh, they moved me down to uh, Wolverhampton three and a half years into my sentence. Um, I got involved in using a phone and had a bit of trouble with a few people out there and then two days later, a couple of days later after we'd been making threats to someone, the police come in, a uh, national crime agency with an Osman warning and said I uh, threatened someone's life. And then from there, then I just never used the phone in a prison again and just said, you know what, I've had enough. And then I just started changing my ways. I got moved from there down to the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. I was there for probably the last 19, 20 months of my sentence. But watching my friends, my family, you know, travel down there, it's taking them 17 hours there and back, you know, to come and see me for an hour. I just said, you know what, I've had enough. And then I spoke to the governor in there one day about an idea I had. My mate told me all about apps on iPhones and stuff like that. And then I spoke to the governor with an idea and told him I had an idea about making an app to help people rehabilitate when they come out of prison and give them all the opportunities to find, you know, housing, opportunities to find like dentists, doctors, you know, all the stuff that you really need when you come out uh, with employment and stuff. That's that, and that's what I went to the governor with. Technology has took over. Police are the biggest gang in the country. They've got the biggest technology in the country and crime doesn't pay. It might pay in the short run, but it certainly won't pay in the long run because if you get higher and higher and higher ranked up in what you're doing, then you're just becoming aware to police and everyone else around you. Look, I changed within a couple of weeks from buying stupid amount of cars for serious amounts of money. When your neighbors are seeing it and other people are seeing you grow and you're wearing nice clothes, nice cars, stuff like that, surely to God the police are watching you as well. So for me, it's look, I'll never say to anyone, you know, don't sell drugs or don't get involved in criminality. But what I will tell you is if I could change my life back then, I would have, but it's led me to where I am today. And like I said, the police are the biggest gang in the country. You ain't, you ain't gonna get around them. When you're sitting in jail and the judge gives you a 30 or 35 year sentence, oh, you know about it because you know you're going to be sitting in that room for God knows how long. And look, prison for me, I, I could say I enjoyed it. I was with people like myself every single day. It's when the door shuts up at night and you can't go see your family or you can't speak to your family and stuff like that. That's when it starts playing in your head, you know? So for me, I'd never say to anyone, don't do this or don't do that. But what I will educate them is that it will come crashing down one day. And if you've bought houses, if you've bought shops, if you've bought clubs, if you've put money into anything and it's in your own name and it's to do with drugs or money, believe me, when the police come, they'll be taking every single bit away from you. Thanks, Thank you very much for the time. Man. It's a problem, See? Yeah.